In Paris, to this day, there is a monument commissioned by a man who raised himself up to be emperor. It is a monument to those who sacrificed their lives for their country during wartime. It was a monument he would never get to see finished because this man would be exiled to a small island in the middle of the South Atlantic for the relentless wars that plunged Europe into conflict. He is a figure that is still draped in the propaganda of the British to this day. We think of this man as short, we think of him as insecure, but Napoleon was neither. So who was he? Well today we're going to evaluate the actions and character of Napoleon and see what it reveals about his psychology. In 1798, General Napoleone Buonaparte of the First French Republic, Revolutionary France, had embarked on a grand adventure. The goal was conquest, to capture what the French considered part of the cradle of civilization, Egypt. The Ottoman Turks had controlled the region for a long time, but their control over Egypt was now tenuous at best. His capture of Egypt was the easy part, holding it another story. Napoleon was forced to deal with multiple uprisings, assassination attempts and great unrest. Napoleon had come to Egypt with explicit instructions to his troops to treat the Muslim faith and the customs of Islam with the utmost respect. He had told his troops to provide protection to Imams, pilgrims and the faithful. But now the French command was faced with the unenviable job of having to administer justice, often harsh justice, to a land that threatened to descend into lawlessness. To make matters much worse, the Ottomans were not going to take a French invasion of their nominal territory lying down, and they dispatched an army under the control of one Ahmed Pasha al jazar Pasha the Butcher. Pasha had accrued many notches on the post of brutality. Napoleon moved to take Palestine and meet Pasha in the field. Now, Napoleon took Gaza and then laid siege to the city of Jaffa, now part of Tel Aviv. Here he met Pasha's soldiers who defended the city. Napoleon sent an officer to Pasha's headquarters, far to the north of the city, demanding a surrender of his troops in Jaffa. Now Pasha had the French officers head and body displaced. The siege continued. The French were getting the upper hand. Again Napoleon sends messengers, this time to the troops in Jaffa themselves. And he demanded the surrender of these troops and promised to spare their lives. But according to some sources, these messengers were also dealt with with brutality and sadism. And this is where it gets difficult to see through the fog of war and know what really transpired. There's no such thing as an unbiased account here. But eventually the defense of the city by Pasha's troops became untenable and they agreed to the terms of surrender. Only that their lives would be spared in return. But the French general had no such plans of carrying out his promise. His troops were as angry as he was, and he let them loose upon the city for two nights. Soldiers doing what soldiers often do when turned loose upon a city. As for the prisoners of war, he marched them out to the desert and... Now some have pointed out that he had no means to feed, water, house and keep watch over 4,000 prisoners. And if he set them free, they would only return to fight his army once more. But others say he would have done it anyway, exacting vengeance for how his messengers had been treated. But what would you have done in that situation? I think about it, and it leads me to the point of saying, well, I wouldn't want to be in that position. Don't put me in a position where I've got to dispatch 4,000 people. And I don't say this flippantly, but many of the people in the pre-modern era that we talk about to this day had to make decisions just like that. Hell, find me a US president 
since the year 1900, not named Jimmy Carter, who you could thoroughly consider a person of good moral fiber. So Napoleon ends the business in Jaffa, and then he starts moving on to Acre, where Pasha was holed up with the majority of his army, and here Napoleon lays siege to the city. But this is where the French general was outwitted. The British, at war with the French at the time, had reinforced Pasha's position in the city and quickly brought their fleet's cannon down upon the French army besieging Acre. Worse still for the French general, an outbreak of the bubonic plague had begun in his troops. He quarantined the afflicted troops and was relatively successful in keeping the outbreak contained. But as the siege wore on, it became clear that the French losses were mounting. Now this would not be a successful siege and the French general came to the realization that he had to retreat. But he couldn't take his plague afflicted troops with him. They were too sick and furthermore, he didn't want the plague to spread. But here the general was faced with a difficult decision. He knew what Pasha the Butcher was capable of. He had heard the stories, stories that would drive fear into even the most steely of hearts. He understood what awaited any French troops left behind, especially given his own treatment of Pasha's surrendered soldiers. The French general, ever a decisive figure, approached the doctor caring for these troops and instructed him to give them an overdose of opium. Better for them to have a pleasant end than the long hellish end that awaited them at the hands of the butcher. This decision, poisoning his own troops, would become a scandal that would dog one Napoleone Buonaparte until his end. But like much of the actions of Napoleon, the closer you get to the truth, the more nuanced the situation becomes. Part of what makes Napoleon such an enigma, and in these next two videos, we'll try to unmask that enigma. What I find most fascinating about Napoleon as a person is that he, like many of the great figures in history, had both creative and destructive tendencies. And I think that when we think of Napoleon, we tend to focus on the literal destruction. We tend to focus on the millions of lives that he took and took without losing much sleep. But like many of his peers during that time in France, he was a revolutionary. He had his utopian vision for the world, his own vision, which started with France. Napoleon reformed France's archaic legal system, 40 legal codes were reduced to one. He reformed taxation. He managed to bring an end to the rampant inflation that had plagued the French Republic. He liberalized trade. He reduced corruption in the government. He instituted effective local government and the prefix system, something that's still in place to this day. He instituted secondary school education and put a focus on maths and science. He resolved the distrust between church and state and his Concordat of 1801 reaffirmed many of the religious freedoms asserted by the revolution and allowed for freedom of worship in France. His domestic agenda cannot and should not be forgotten. Wherever Napoleon conquered, he sought to spread what he considered to be the best parts of the French Revolution while discarding the worst excesses. But he still took the lives of millions of people. And that shouldn't be forgotten. However, Napoleon is often thought of as this rabid warmonger who fought endless wars for the sake of conquest. But like with every other aspect of our conception of Napoleon, the closer you get to the truth, the more nuance you see. He fought many wars, but until 1807, they were largely defensive. Even at the height of what is considered Napoleon's hubris, his disastrous invasion of Russia in 1812 that led to the destruction of one of the greatest armies the world has ever known, some historians think Napoleon hadn't thought of attempting to conquer Russia proper at all. He thought he would just fight a few pitch battles, put Tsar Alexander back in his place, extract the necessary concessions, 
and bring Russia back into the fold of his European project. A Tsar and a Russia that saw itself as just as much an ascendant power in Europe as Napoleon and France. A Tsar who had just taken Finland from the Swedes. A Tsar who had broken his alliance with France and with it his promise not to do trade with France's mortal enemy, the Brits. A Tsar who had demanded Napoleon remove all of his troops from Prussia and the nation of Poland, which, by the way, Napoleon had just resurrected. And Tsar Alexander did all of this because he saw Poland and Prussia as a Russian sphere of influence. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? And so the closer we look, the more nuance we find. It's not so cut and dry anymore, is it? But Napoleon still took the lives of millions of people. And I repeat this not to signal some greater virtue of my being, but because there's no worse sin of historians than those who only look through a revisionist lens. And while I'm not a historian, I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I hope you'll entertain this brief diversion, but I encountered a professor like this when I was a younger undergrad. And I took this course on the Silk Roads, and we had this series of lectures on Genghis Khan. And throughout these lectures, this professor, well, he sung the praises of a man who was the anti-consent, who was bloodthirsty, he was cruel, he was callous. God put entire cities to the sword, both literally and metaphorically. And not once did this professor mention any of them. It was all just the positives. He treated the subject matter like he was a, a botanist, observing the new plant growth in the wake of a forest fire with not a second thought to the human consequences and suffering of the fire itself. And I remember going up to him after this lecture and asking him why he didn't mention that. Did he not think that it was important? You know what, I don't actually remember what he said, but I do remember that it wasn't very impressive or convincing. And here at Moorpork, we treat everything with an even hand, and so we would be remiss not to acknowledge that while Napoleon was one of the greatest figures in our history, he was not necessarily a good person. And that leads us to a psychological theme, that of Napoleon's supposed Machiavellianism. He was tarred with it by his contemporaries, and there are plenty of those who have come afterwards who have given his figure that same brush. Now Machiavellianism is a trait that forms part of the Dark Triad. The term comes from the 14th century work by Niccolo Machiavelli. In essence, the ends of power justify the means to obtain and maintain it. Nothing is strictly off the table. Many sources state that Napoleon was quite the fan of Machiavelli. And we have a primary source where Napoleon said himself that Machiavelli was the only book that he could read and that Gibbon was a waste of time. Now we know that to be a jest of sorts because the context of that statement was him comparing Machiavelli with William Gibbon of Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire fame. So we know that Napoleon read extremely widely. In fact, he speaks as much in his own diaries. Napoleon is known to have taken a whole library on campaign with him. But it's reasonably clear that he read Machiavelli deeply. Now, whether you believe Napoleon to have the trait of Machiavellianism really comes down to how you formulate it. If we take a classic definition, we've got four domains. A relative lack of affect and personal relationships. A lack of interest in conventional morality. A lack of mental impairment. And low commitment to ideology. And when we look at those four aspects, those four categories of Machiavellianism. We can see that when it comes to Napoleon, well, it's complicated. Let's deal with a relative lack of affect in personal relationships. Napoleon pined after a wife that didn't love him. He was absolutely smitten by his first wife, Josephine, and it took him many years to come to the realization that she would never return his affection. Furthermore, Napoleon had a close friendship with Marshal Jean Lanz. The two had met during the Italian campaign of 1796, where Napoleon took his first command as a newly minted general in the revolutionary French army, where Lanz was 
only a colonel. Lance would serve faithfully under Napoleon for 15 years, rising through the ranks to become one of Napoleonic France's best military minds. The bond between Napoleon and Lance was, by all accounts, a very strong one. There are multiple eyewitnesses that report that when Lance was mortally wounded, Napoleon rushed to him, embraced him, kissing him with urgency and weeping without control. This was no mere show for the troops either, for after Lance passing, Napoleon was observed in the privacy of a tent to have spent a good deal of time staring into his soup before he broke down in tears. Napoleon also had a close friendship with French general Gérard de Roc. They'd come up together in the academy. When Duroc was mortally wounded by a cannonball in 1813, Napoleon rushed to be with him after the battle. He tried to encourage Duroc, but Duroc asked for opium to put the matter to rest. According to sources such as Constant and Las Cassis, Napoleon couldn't bear the pain of seeing his friend slowly ebbing away in great pain, and he left for his own tent where he sat in silence with his hands together over his face for a long time. So it's not as though Napoleon didn't have empathy, but perhaps more that he just reserved it for very special figures in his life. It's kind of hard not to when you've survived more assassination attempts than you can count on two hands, and when you're constantly at war, and when you are the emperor. Your pull of confidence to draw upon <laughs> that you could trust. It's going to be by its nature not a pool of great depth. So he did care for some people, and rather deeply. But the key question is relative lack. And to be honest, I'm not sure where I stand on that one. Let's deal with the lack of conventional morality. Napoleon was a restorer of social norms in France. He looked down upon women and men who showed a lack of modesty in dress, often making quips or remarks at their expense. He was publicly against adultery, forcing the capable foreign minister Talleyrand to marry his own mistress. Although privately after coming to terms with his own wife's affairs, Napoleon engaged in many affairs himself. Accounts range from between 8 to 24 mistresses. After inviting many of the noble émigrés back to France to rejoin his court, Napoleon commissioned a voluminous 800-page manual on a code of etiquette to be observed at court. But privately, Napoleon in some ways detested it, stating etiquette is the prison of kings. And spoken directly to the French writer Las Cassis later, quote, Necessity compelled me to establish etiquette, Otherwise, I would have been liable every day to be slapped on the shoulder. Speaking on ceremonies, Napoleon was even more crystal clear that they served his instrumental purposes. A newly established government must dazzle and astonish, he said. The moment it ceases to glitter, it falls. And again later, quote, display is to power what ceremony is to religion. What this seems to suggest is that Napoleon knew the outward importance of convention, but how he acted in person and private wasn't necessarily congruent with it. Now here's a bit of a spicy one. People often point to Napoleon's good treatment of the Jewish people relative to how they were treated prior. In many kingdoms of Europe at the time, Jews were held in ghettos, and pogroms and expulsions were not uncommon. Napoleon renounced all of that, and he stated publicly that, quote, I will never accept any proposals that will obligate the Jewish people to leave France, because to me, Jews are the same as to any other citizen in our nation. Whichever nation Napoleon subjugated, that client state then had to get rid of their ghettos. Jews were allowed to live with everybody else once more. He stated in a letter from exile that this was because he wished to see the Jews put on equality, with Catholics and Protestants, and to have them assimilate into France, but that he wanted them to stop money lending, and also that he wanted to draw on the great wealth of theirs to France, since Jews would naturally choose to immigrate to a country where they were treated better. But then in a much earlier letter in 1808 to his brother Jerome, he states that 
he doesn't want Jews to immigrate to France at all, that he's actively trying to discourage it, and he refers to the Jewish people as the most despicable of mankind. Now, okay, historical context. Anti-Semitism, pretty common back then. Emancipating Jewish people counts for something, but there's plenty of smoke here that it was serving his instrumental goals, rather than some higher noble cause. All we can really say here is that Napoleon might have cared, or he might not have, and it depends on who he was talking to. But again, if he were just modifying his perspective to fit the audience, is that not just evidence of Machiavellianism? But what about his conduct in the military realm? Napoleon was renowned for going among his soldiers, of seeking their campfire, holding conversations with the common soldier. He gave the appearance of caring for their welfare, but privately, he would make statements such as his famous line, quote, you can't beat me. I spend 30,000 lives a month, spending them as if they were resources. To Napoleon, soldiers were human resources, to be used and used up where needed. But he needed them to be inspired by his leadership. His letter to Chappelle reveals this somewhat contradictory position. Quote, A general's most important talent is to know the mind of the soldier and gain his confidence. And in both respects, the French soldier is more difficult to lead than another. He's not a machine that must be made to move, but he is a reasonable being who needs leadership. So Napoleon, well, he understood the soldier's psychology. But although he paid lip service to the notion of humanity, instrumentally, a human being's worth to Napoleon lay in their utility to him. Here again we see two Napoleons, the image he crafted for himself, and the reality that lay beyond the mask. Let's deal with mental impairment. This one I think is, is relatively difficult again because there are multiple passages in Napoleon's diary where he admits to being afflicted by the black dog of melancholy, even considering at two different points in his early career whether he should remove himself from the grand race of life altogether. So was Napoleon susceptible to depression? It certainly seems that way. His melancholy early in his career appeared to stem from rumination over his lack of achievement. Just like Caesar crying in front of the statue of Alexander, weeping over the fact that he was the same age as Alexander, who had conquered most of the known world by that age, while Caesar had done nothing of the sort. Admittedly, these bouts in Napoleon had tended to occur earlier in his youth, and by the time he was leading his nation, Napoleon undoubtedly had nerves of steel. And this strikes at the heart of this debate about how fixed personality really is. But perhaps the nuance here for Napoleon is that one can become more Machiavellian, just like one can become more conscientious. Thus, perhaps a better question is, at what time point do we want to measure Napoleon's Machiavellianism? Let's deal with a low commitment to ideology. This is an interesting one, because when we talk about low commitment to ideology, we're talking about flexibility and what one ascribes to, or indeed not really having an inward belief in ideology, not really believing in anything concrete oneself, perhaps using ideology to one's own ends, but ultimately pragmatism when it comes to what the person actually believes. Napoleon as a youth detested the French. He dreamed of freeing his native Corsica from French rule and helping lead Corsica to independence. That didn't last long. When his family was cast out of Corsica by the independence movement, they landed as refugees in southern France, and quickly Napoleon began to change his tune on France. When revolution broke out, Napoleon was less than enthused. He despised the lack of order that it brought, but soon he realized the opportunities it might bring. And while he disagreed with the ways and means of the Jacobins, he wasn't above setting those aside to make powerful connections with family members of the top brass within the directorate, befriending the brother of Maximilian Robespierre in order to advance his career. 
But when the Robespierre's and their faction were overthrown in the Thermidor reaction, Napoleon was imprisoned for a 10 day week. Now, had he been in Paris, the story of Napoleon might have ended right then and there. But Napoleon had been in Nice to attend his brother's wedding. The distance granted time for passions to cool off and for the new faction leading the revolution to perhaps realize that there was insufficient evidence that Napoleon was a problem to them. He was released and quickly distanced himself from the Robespierre's and the Jacobins. Although Napoleon was a soldier of the revolution that had raised him up to be a general, he never really bought into it. When he brought the first French Republic to an end, assuming dictatorial powers, Napoleon paid mere lip service to this notion that he was a continuation of the revolution, that it lived on in him. But to his contemporaries, they knew the score. That said, Napoleon did grow into an ideology. It was just the ideology of Napoleon, Bonapartism. And so when we look at these four different aspects, it's kind of mixed. In some respects, yeah, you would put him squarely in the one column for that aspect, and other ones not so clear-cut. Other models of Machiavellianism incorporate other additional aspects such as planfulness, i.e. deliberation and orderliness, and agency. For instance, achievement striving, assertiveness, self-confidence, activity and competence. Now, although these two categories don't make somebody Machiavellian unto themselves, planfulness and agency, well, that is Napoleon to a T. The man would study every battlefield down to the very last knoll. He planned incessantly and reviewed the plans of others, correcting mistakes that he saw along the way. Napoleon was indefatigable. He famously said six hours of sleep for men, seven for women, and eight for the fool. Napoleon ate fast so that he could get back to work, if he even stopped for work over dinner. He would often rise in the middle of the night to make plans, dragging his private secretary, Meneval, up to the study with him. According to some observers, he could work for up to 18 hours straight and never miss a beat. The man that led France also led himself. He never once doubted his ability to achieve victory. That was what won him so many battles. But the same thing that in later years meant that the French response to diplomatic provocation and to Napoleon not having his goal fulfilled was ultimately always going to lead to spending lives on the battlefield. It's what led him to push on to Moscow, leading to the grisly end of hundreds of thousands of his loyal soldiers. What led him to the Hundred Days. It's what led him to Waterloo. It's what led him to St. Helena in the middle of the South Atlantic. Now I'll leave the final decision up to you as to whether Napoleon had the trait of Machiavellianism within him, or like Caesar, that he simply carried a grandiosity complex. It's interesting, isn't it? How many of these great people of history all seem to have this unwavering belief that they were destined for this. They all carry this fire of ambition deep within them, and Napoleon studied these people. He read about Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great voraciously. It's why Napoleon was so hot to trot over the prospect of taking Egypt. But it's also why his seizure of power in the coup of 18 Brumaire, 1799, had the ear of Caesarean theatrics to it. While Napoleon had been in Egypt, France was amid unrest. The war of the Second Coalition against France had caused a number of military defeats, given to the French by the hands of the Russians in Italy. Furthermore, royalist uprisings in the south of France had stretched the Republican armies thin. The winds of change were in the air. The common folk were fed up with the directory. With his Egypt campaign turning into a hot mess, Napoleon headed back for France, abandoning his troops. When he arrived in France, he was hailed as a hero. The military situation in the meantime had stabilised. But a coup had taken place, ousting the Jacobin government and leaving one Emmanuel Joseph Sieres in charge of the directory. Sieres was the ultimate survivor of the French revolutionary period. 
He was a moderate, but he had managed to escape the wrath of the Jacobins under Robespierre during the terror by careful alignment of his professed views with that of the ruling clique. Above all, Sears was a man of ambition and was plotting a coup of his own to seize power. In the popular general Napoleone Bonaparte, Sears felt that he had found a worthy general to help lead him to ultimate power. Little did he know, Napoleon was plotting a coup of his own. A three-dimensional coup. A coup within a coup. The army was initially hesitant to the plot, but Napoleon went about assuaging their doubts. With troops stationed throughout the capital at key places, the Sears coup rolled into motion. The French government had three assemblies. The Council of 500, something akin to a house. The Council of Ancients, akin to a senate. And the executive branch, the directorate. A Council of Five. The plan was to dissolve the directorate and have the Council of 500 and the Council of Ancients comply with the coup and draft a new constitution. Now, Sears and Napoleon managed to have the directory disassembled in short order. After all, Sears was one of the directors. But the two legislative councils proved to be made of much tougher stuff, refusing to join the Sears coup and having an argument about whether to issue sentences and have the plotters arrested and put out to pasture. Napoleon, perhaps impatient or perhaps quite rightly sensing that in a coup, time is of the essence, marched into both councils uninvited with a large military attachment. Here he tried to convince the councils to stand down. Buoyed by his belief in his oratory skills, he first gave a speech to the Council of Ancients, where he was shouted out of the building. Next, Napoleon tried his luck with the Council of 500, where his brother Lucien Bonaparte was the president. Napoleon was again harangued from the crowd, and here a large councillor accosted him physically, picking him up and throwing the general. If not for the intervention of his troops, Napoleon might have met a bloody end right then and there. Napoleon's troops got between him and the violent councillors and managed to escort him out of the building. Here we see that Napoleon was capable of drinking his own Kool-Aid as such. He was capable of overestimation. Now tensions were clearly at a peak here and things were looking like they might get bloody. Council members began to debate and argue about having Napoleon arrested, but they needed to make contact with and convince the large parts of the military that remained on the fence. It's fascinating actually to consider how close Napoleon was to failure here, that he might never have become the Napoleon that we know today had it not been for the swift intervention of his younger brother. As Napoleon remained outside the building, visibly shaken, Lucian slipped out of the council and informed the soldiers that were loyal to the council, that were guarding the council building, that the majority of the council were now being held hostage by a minority brandishing daggers. Then Lucian grabbed a sword and pointed it straight at his brother's gut and said, if Napoleon were to ever betray the liberty, egality and fraternity of the French Revolution, he would put an end to him himself. But Lucian was in on the rig. He was with Napoleon all the way to the top. Enough of the soldiers were convinced by this display and they went into the council chambers to disperse the council. With one council dispersed, the ancients feeling under threat adjourned both of the councils for a period of three months and appointed Bonaparte, Sears and another man, Ducos, a prominent councillor, as proconsuls. Napoleon quickly had the army round up compliant councillors, and here Napoleon played his ace. He had the councillors draw up a constitution that assured that one of the three proconsuls would be first consul, holding more power than the others. The man who had come to fill that position? None other than Napoleon Bonaparte. The new constitution created a senate whose job it was to interpret the constitution and in practice to allow the first consul to rule by decree. Napoleon had executed a nearly bloodless coup, ending the French Revolution and setting the stage for the first French Empire. Now what does this period of time show us about Napoleon's character? 
about his mental state. Firstly, I think it reveals that Napoleon, while a very strategic thinker and a decisive personality, was sometimes blinded by his own narcissism. While he was capable of being an inspirational orator to his troops, and a man who had no shortage of understanding of theatrics, he walked into a hostile crowd in the council chambers and just expected them to fall in line. Instead, their shouts and threats and eventual violence had Napoleon's confidence collapse. But the very fact that Napoleon had a brother there in that position to bail him out, well, it speaks to Napoleon's character, doesn't it? And you might think that Lucian made his own way into that position, but no. He was arrested during the Thermidorian reaction against the Jacobins, and it was Napoleon who interceded, who bailed him out. What I'm telling you is that this was a card that Napoleon had up his sleeve, and he knew it. I'll let you decide whether you think Lucian Bonaparte and Napoleon cooked up the entire scheme together to have him accosted, to have Lucian come to the troops defending the council and tell them that it was a threat against the councillors' lives and against Napoleon's life. The theatrics of pointing the sword at Napoleon and vowing to slay him should he ever betray the Republic? We're ultimately never going to know. What we do know, though, is that Napoleon was a brilliant tactician and strategist. And it just doesn't seem likely to me that this Napoleon would leave so much up to chance when he was such a planful individual. Napoleon was, after all, a student of history. He knew the fall of the Roman Republic like the back of his hand. And so there Napoleon was, in late 1799, having taken control of France. Soon Sierres and Ducos were sidelined. Within four years, Napoleon would have himself crowned Emperor of the French. And it was a deft move to avoid the numerous assassination attempts that were made against him during the previous four years. Once Napoleon was Emperor, he had an issue, and then getting rid of him just meant a second Napoleon. At his coronation, Napoleon invited the Pope. And the scene shows Napoleon's brilliance for symbolism, because roughly a thousand years earlier, the Pope had crowned one Charlemagne. Charlemagne rued the fact that the Pope had placed the crown atop his head, for in doing so, it was the Pope who was the ultimate authority. Here it was Napoleon that placed the crown upon his own head. He sent a powerful message. Napoleon was the ultimate power in France, and he ruled by his own authority. Join me next time as we explore how this ultimate power ultimately corrupted Napoleon in part two of Unmasking the Enigma of Napoleon. Okay, postscript time. It's been a while, folks, hasn't it? I'm sorry. I've missed you. But uh, life has been incredibly busy with my PhD and all the, the rest of it, the teaching, the marking, etc, etc, etc. Maybe even a little bit of partying in there somewhere. A man has got to blow off some steam, right? Um, but I would like to be making these videos more often than I am. There's no doubt about it. Um, so I have the script pretty much finished uh, for the second half of this. It's just about getting this one edited and out the door and into your hands and then uh, we can get cracking on part two. And then I think after that, uh, I would expect to be putting out videos more often, which just have uh, a shorter duration to them. You know, maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. But that's not the end of the road for this channel, because if you haven't seen my other videos on great figures in historical, in the historical record, <laughs> here's a couple of videos to my, to my left, to your right. You can check them out right now. And if you like this video and you want to see more, you can do me a massive favor by hitting subscribe, hit the bell, uh, give this video a like. The whole nine yards, you can do it all. It's not a zero-sum game. Okay, until next time.